Welcome to Ignite to Impact, a weekly podcast that explores what it takes to make your community, our nation, and the world a better place. You've tuned in to be inspired and enlightened as we pull back the curtain and dive into intimate and energetic conversations with achievers and doers. We are talking with leaders who are in the trenches making phenomenal changes through business, nonprofits, education, and the arts. Our goal? To encourage, motivate, and challenge you to go to the next level in leadership. Now, here's your host, Master Leadership Strategist, Dr. Geneva Williams. So, let's ignite to impact. Hey there, this is Dr. Geneva. How are you today? And thank you for joining me on Ignite to Impact. Once again, as we have fabulous, awesome conversations in the Voice Over Production studio of Gerald McBride. We're so delighted to be here and in studio talking with individuals, uh, artists, business folk, lawyers, doctors, everyday folk who are making a difference in the world, who are you know, getting their impact on. And they do it by igniting causes, by working in the trenches, by trying to end homelessness, guiding young people, turning around uh, low literacy rates, just, just doing their things. So we're just delighted that we can have conversations with folk who are really making a difference and impact in the community and we just love to explore why it is that they do what they do when they do it and I'm thrilled to have today with me a a young brother uh, uh, someone who's uh, acts on these words seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave those are some of his favorite words, and I'm with, and please meet, the Reverend Charles E. Williams, the second. That's right. Born in Detroit, Michigan, uh, but reared in Birmingham, Alabama. He uses his life experience to guide himself and his work in leading the fight for workers' rights, civil rights, equality, access for the underserved populations of the world and for working with young people. From college campus, political activity, social justice, corporate and issue campaigns to leading political campaigns for candidates like U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow and Al Sharpton. He is there and in the middle of things. He's currently the president of the National Action Network Detroit chapter and pastor of the King Solomon Missionary Baptist Church, which, as many as you, of you may know, is an historic pulpit, um, the place that has been added to the National Register of Historic Places. And that was done in uh, several years ago. And it's an historic mm-hmm. place. And he is the pastor. And he comes to us today to talk about a lot of things. But we want to talk about what he's doing with young people. Welcome, Reverend Williams. Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Dr. Williams. And uh, I, I certainly appreciate being able to uh, call you, Dr. Williams. Uh, one day I might have my people. <laughs> and so we can be Doc and Doc. We can, we can be right. Dr. Williams and Dr. Williams. How about All that? right. That sounds good. But you know, the, the thing is, it isn't in the title, but it's the work. It's the work. And it always is the work. That's right. And hard. that's what we want to talk about today. But before we do that, Reverend Williams, if you don't mind, I would love for our listening audience to get to know a little bit more about you. And so I, I understand that you were raised in Detroit, mm-hmm. um, but reared in Birmingham, Alabama. So yeah. how did that happen? My, my father was a postal worker and uh, mother was a bank teller. And they had two children at uh, uh, one and two, one or two and four years old. Uh-huh. And uh, early in their life, they made a decision uh, that uh, they wanted to uh, raise us in, in Southern lifestyle. 
And okay. uh, my father saw the transfer from the post office, and uh, he they moved. We moved, got up, got a big truck, and filled it up, and moved my my sister and I to uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh-huh. And so I matriculated through. Uh, Pre-K, uh, I mean, excuse me, K through 12, mm-hmm. uh, or well, K through 10, ninth, ninth grade. We moved mm-hmm. here back in, ni- in my mind, ninth grade year. Okay. Uh, matriculated uh, those years through uh, high school. Uh, came back to Michigan, lived mm-hmm. in Monroe, Michigan, oh, okay. where I graduated from Monroe High School. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then in, my sister ended up going to Michigan State. I ended mm-hmm. up going to Eastern Michigan. Okay. Graduated there and said, look, I'm a Detroiter. Uh huh. And I'm going back home to Detroit. Okay. And uh, 15, 15 uh, see, let me see, I'm 36, mm-hmm. and I came back to Detroit around 21, 22. So what? 15 years later, I'm back in, back in home, back home, back mm-hmm. all the way home. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, beautiful place. Yes. I have a, you know, my grandparents are from here. They, okay. of course, they they left uh, left the South uh, with uh, uh, as as many. Uh, parents did or grandparents did uh, left the south came to Detroit and uh, I have a special affinity for it because yes. of uh, it's beautiful open arms to African Americans uh, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of being able to make it into the middle class and mm-hmm. so uh, we appreciate that history although yes. it may not be today's story but we're going to work okay. continue working, working on, on it that's right. Yes. that's right so what was it like growing up in Birmingham Alabama you know, it, it, I, I believe, honestly, um, growing up in Birmingham is one of the significant, more significant contributions to my race consciousness. Okay. Uh, I was in a John Hancock fabric store with my mother. I remember I was about 12 years old. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, I remember I was, you know, always been a big young man, you know, even at 12 years old, okay. I was tall, tall and kind of stout mm-hmm. and uh, walking alongside with my mother. And I remember uh, two uh, white women walking past us and saying, uh, and I heard them say, uh, watch your purse. And uh, uh-huh. that day, uh, that moment in my life uh, was a life changing moment. And it wasn't that I had hate for them. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, I, 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 I don't believe that racism is a uh, symptom of, of hate from even white folks. Uh, I think it's just a symptom of ignorance. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and ever since then, I've sought to uh, uh, right those wrongs I and see. educate where there needs to be education mm-hmm. uh, and fight for justice where there is injustice. Mm-hmm. So growing up in uh, Alabama, um, were there... So certainly this was one event. Mm -hmm. Were there others that because you're on it's clear you're a leader (laughs) and and you, of course, you lead a congregation, you lead very important organizations. Were there things that you could trace back to your growing up, Mm -hmm. your childhood, and particularly in Alabama, where you learned some leadership lessons? Well, you know, leadership lessons uh, certainly uh, have come from watching those who've come before me. As uh-huh. a young man, I think one of the most uh, one of the, one one of the most uh, uh, strategic things that I have done as a, a young young person. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, because p- some people would say, "Well, you're young now," and, That's I, right. and, and I am, I am. <laughs> but you know, when I was fourteen and fifteen and sixteen, I never was ashamed of mimicking uh, older men who were around me. Mm-hmm. Uh, never, I never was ashamed of that. I've, I never was scared to do that. Uh, I always believed that they passed through this life and they passed through points of life before me and so they must have something to offer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never never was wor- worried about, well, are you gonna, you're gonna look like an old man or you're gonna look too, you know, you you sound like an old man. Well, I, I'm, I'm watching what they're doing and mm-hmm. And I think mimicking them uh, Mm -hmm. as a young man or as a boy and as a child, I I remember when I... uh had the opportunity to meet I was, I was in first grade I was it's just funny we were talking about this I was okay. just writing about it I'm uh-huh. working on some literary works myself and uh-huh. 
and and I remember in first grade, I was uh, my parents took me to go see Reverend Jesse Jackson. Oh, uh, it was probably yeah. 1984, okay. 1985, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. I mean, it must have been it must have been 88 because I was in first grade, mm-hmm. and uh, he was campaigning. Okay, and, when he was uh, running for he president, when he was running for president. Okay, and uh, my su- he picked. I never remember he picked up my sister. She was much younger than me uh-huh. and he kissed her and did you know did the uh-huh. usual politic politician thing. things uh, yes and kissing babies yeah kissing yeah. babies right. and all that uh-huh. and um, I went back to school that day mm-hmm. and we were all in first grade of course you know you have to keep a journal and write a journal uh-huh. and, and that day I wrote in my journal uh, I met Reverend Jackson Jackson today mm-hmm. and uh, you know I want to run for president of the United uh-huh. States of America okay. and and and, and that, that example I, I I guess I, I mean that those moments in life where you see something so much greater than yourself and you it causes you to ignite and desire uh, to to work towards uh, a future or work towards a goal. I mean, those are the moments that that really make you productive. And those are the mm-hmm. moments that keep you leading, because if you don't have those moments and uh, it becomes very dark and, and it becomes very difficult to see your way through. But when mm-hmm. you know that people like that had to face ups and downs and people uh, who have achieved certain amount of success had to, you know, make it through roadblocks and had to jump through hurdles. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, you know, when you watch even their lives today uh, and you see that they still have that same type of tenacity is inspiring. And it is, it is certainly made a a great contribution uh, to, to my, I won't say just desire to lead, but mm-hmm. to the the current day issues that I face all of the time as we uh, sit in this beautiful studio, uh, McBride Studio. I'm looking at uh, Muhammad Ali as he stands uh, over one of his uh, characters and, you know, uh, or one of his uh, comp- uh, opponents. And, you know, I, I'm thinking that that is that is life. Um, that that is that is a part of of winning, but it's also a part of. But you have to sometimes lose to get to that point. So, I I, um, I I take those lessons with me, and I take the lessons of those who have come before me. Uh, most importantly, to to make it into uh, uh, surpass or to continue to excel in the future. Just an awesome experience you know first grade meeting reverend jackson do you re- do you use that as do you reflect back on that uh these days as you go through various um different experiences or even uh does it make a difference in terms of what you see yourself doing these days and today you know, I, I think uh, one of the most important uh, uh, reflections uh, that I, I kind of hold with me mm-hmm. uh, are those mm-hmm. those stories, mm-hmm. uh, stories of experiences of, of racism or the stories of uh, watching uh, leadership. Mm-hmm. But I think more importantly, uh, I, I just try to, to continue to remain humble. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I tell you why, because... Mm-hmm. When I think about where I am today and where I come from, you know, I come I, I didn't necessarily come from uh, to to, you know, my child, Charlie, uh, mm-hmm. she she's I mean, she's she she has a mother who's, a, you know, a medical doctor. She has a mm-hmm. father who's a. Uh, respected or prominent minister in the mm-hmm. city. I mean, I, you know, I came from, I had a postal worker that was a father, that was a postal worker and a mother that was a bank teller. Mm-hmm. Uh, and watching them uh, matriculate in their life, uh, go from, from postal worker to, you know, master's level uh, individuals and, and professionals mm-hmm. uh, w- w- was a great inspiration. But I, I, said, I said that to say is because I, I try to, I, I, I think I always thought that I would go somewhere in uh-huh. life. Okay. But I, 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 I never really expected to get there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you look up. Uh-huh. You look up at some point in life and you say, wow, I, you know, I've made it thus far. I can't yes. believe I've gotten this far. Um, but keeping an attitude of humil- humility is what I've learned mm-hmm. is what continues, what keeps you continuing to grow. Mm-hmm. 
because I can look at where I'm at and say, oh, I done made it. I'm arrived. Mm-hmm. I'm a member of great society. I'm a member of this organization mm-hmm. and people look up to me. But at the end of the day, it's not about any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more so about the impact that you make from now, from, from the beginning of your life to yes. the end of your life. That's right. And so I, I just want to continue to make an impact. Okay. I want to try to stay uh, uh, humble as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 that that when I say try to stay, that's important. That is not that is a very very important leadership characteristics, mm-hmm. uh, a characteristic. When I mm-hmm. say try to stay mm-hmm. uh, humble, that's very very uh, important because you can you can become too big in your own mind uh, and 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 stop growing. Mm. And I never want to stop growing. Okay. And I never want to stop getting mm-hmm. better. I mm-hmm. want to be better. I, you know, it's like you know, I work out every morning. Mm-hmm. And you know, oftentimes people say, "Wow, man, you lost so much weight, and you, you've come so far." And wow, just you know, you know, you can just, you can just stop now, right? And I'm saying, no, no. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I'm, I, I, I want to be my very best. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times we don't think about it like that. We get to a certain place. Okay, I'm a certain weight now. Oh, I got a certain amount of money now. Oh, I have a certain amount of prominence now. Oh, I have a certain amount of respect now. Now I, I've made it. I've arrived. I stopped. That that in turn will never, never grow your leadership past uh, the level that you have achieved. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to grow f- further, I, I, I think you've got to remain humble and you've got to c- continue to critique yourself in such a way that you would cause to grow. Yes. And and that's such a, um, a wonderful, um, you know, life lesson mm-hmm. um, that you've learned at, yes, such a young age. <laughs> <laughs> because you are a Gen Xer and um, you are the future uh, generation. And so, you know, you tweeted, we are starting a... Sea Cadets program in hashtag Detroit. Interested in participating or volunteering? Come Saturday at noon at your church. Hmm. Absolutely. Tell us about that. You know, I um, work intently in the community, and as you know, there every summer, there every summer uh, or every spring, the sun comes out. Uh, after it's been hiding, it's getting ready to go into hiding now. Uh, but but uh, the sun comes out. Uh, uh, the 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 tops on the drop the drop tops uh, drop on the cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, the young people with uh, bust out of the houses into the neighborhoods, and unfortunately, uh, we hear usually about some traumatic uh, scenario mm-hmm. where there is a child that is shot. Uh, where there is a young person that is shot, where there's an individual caught up in violence or, or drug activity. And um, every, every, every spring, every spring and summer, we have developed this uh, process where when that happens, uh, community members gather, uh, stand on the street corner uh, with with candlelights mm-hmm. uh, or march in the streets. Yes. And we say, we're tired of this. Mm-hmm. No more violence. Mm-hmm. This is not going to happen. This stops today. Mm-hmm. And it happens every single year. Mm-hmm. And we do little to really impact the environment that we're raising these children up in that consistently suck them into this violence and drug culture. And so what I have, um, what I've done is I've partnered with the, the United States Naval Sea Cadets, which is, which is a nationally uh, renowned program that is connected to the United States Navy and it was, in, and it was uh, chartered by the United States Congress. Uh, and there was no program. I checked into Detroit and I said, well, this we need this type of program in Detroit, mm-hmm. uh, and unfortunately, not only was there no program in Detroit, 
but there was no program in any urban center in America. Really? Most okay. of the programs are all in suburb areas. Mm-hmm. The program's very impactful because it engages young people with an opportunity to learn any and everything and engage in any type of military training that the military has to offer. Mm-hmm. From pho- photography to legal to medical to radio and communication. I mean, you could just, that, really? the list goes on yeah. and on. Okay. Of all of the different trainings and opportunities that they have to engage in uh, when they get involved in this program. Mm-hmm. And so I thought to myself, I said, the only reason, the only way that we will change the culture of violence in urban centers in America, but most importantly, even in Detroit. Mm -hmm. The only way that we're going to do that is we're going to have to change a generation. And the only way we're going to have to change, the only way we're going to be able to change a generation is we're going to have to engage these young people like we've never engaged them before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and open them up for opportunities and everything. And so we started the program earlier in the year I believe it was February of of this year. We started the program. Uh, We've got about 25 cadets so far. Uh, They've been operating throughout the program. I mean, and they just excelling. I mean, I was we we took a group out uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on Lake St. Clair Mm -hmm. uh, to sail. Uh, not uh, and and it's just amazing to see how they you know they can put the sails up and uh-huh. they can keep the boat in the wind yes. and mm-hmm. they're not scared when the boat tilts a little mm-hmm. bit. I mean it's just mm-hmm. amazing to see how much they have grown mm-hmm. and and these are things that they wouldn't have access to mm-hmm. or they wouldn't have an opportunity to do. I mean most young people stay at home in the basement and play video games all day. Yes. and 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 watch these young people out there sailing a boat or out there. Uh, learning uh, the different things about the Marine or uh, the Coast Guard. I mean, it's just beautiful to see that they're actually sowing seeds for their tomorrow. And I, I would, I am very enthused about just having the opportunity to be there for them. And the adults that have come out that have volunteered their time and their finance, and they put on the uniform. You know, I put on the uniform too. Uh-huh. We put on the yeah. uniform, and and we we get out there and show them drills and how to I, I, I was in ROTC when I was in college okay and and in high school and so yes. we, we, we know the stuff to show them how to drill and all and how enthused they are about it and how mm-hmm. much they look to come in mm-hmm. every week and most importantly making an impact and keeping some child out of something that would have drawn them yes in something that would have pulled them away from productivity and put them into a place where they would just spiral into drugs and negativity. And that was the point of us starting the program, and that's why we work so hard for it. Okay, well, if you're just joining us, I am having a delightful conversation with Reverend Charles E. Williams, uh, pastor of the King Solomon Missionary Baptist Church, which, as you know, is an historic church where Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Thurgood Marshall, and a host of other American leaders used as a stage to spread uh, a progressive message for change. So we're just delighted to have him here. And we're talking about C. Cadets. Now, that's S E A C, like the ocean, C Cadets, and the C Cadets program in Detroit. Yeah. No, uh, and though I understand this is a national program, it was pretty much absent in urban areas. And in Detroit, you mm-hmm. started it up. So, what happens? So, first of all, what's the age range and what happens? How does a young person sign up for? This program, if I, let's pretend for a moment, I were, a, what is it, a 10 year old or is whatever age yeah. the program starts, that I was that age, um, what would I do? What would happen? What would I be exposed to? Well, I, especially for your online listeners here, uh, one of the best ways to, uh, to, to get information is to go to www.ccadets.org. That's www.ccadets, S-E-A, cadets.org. And then there's a join us Uh button that you hit. Terrific. You hit the join us button. Yes. 
put your name, put your mm-hmm. address. If mm-hmm. you live in the Detroit area, put Detroit in there. Okay. Uh, and you put your information. And then that goes to our, that comes into our system. Okay. Uh, and then we are able to contact you, invite you to a drill session where the young people will be there. Okay. Uh, and a lot of times we like to get the parents the opportunity to watch one, watch mm. it, watch it happen. Okay. Uh, and, and then we also like to uh, do an orientation with the, the future cadet or the future okay. student. Um, that's one way to do it. Or if you if you if you just say, look, I don't, I don't want to get into all that online stuff. I just want to uh-huh. get right into this thing. All right. Then you come over to King Solomon. We meet okay. there uh, every Saturday mm-hmm. at twelve noon. Mm-hmm. Every Saturday mm-hmm. at twelve noon from twelve to three p.m. Yes. Uh, that's sixty one hundred Fourteenth Street, mm-hmm. uh, f- Detroit, Michigan four eight two zero eight. And and we like clockwork will be there. So yes. someone will always be yeah. there to uh, talk to you, engage you, and then uh, uh, induct you into the program. Right. And so what happens with the program? So let's say you know I probably do what what you said that uh, probably want to come. Right right over okay. and just come right up to your door mm-hmm. and so the ages i understand are uh, 10 and is actually two age ranges okay uh, great the first age range is 10 to 13 all right those are navy league cadets okay. uh, they're the younger group mm-hmm. uh, they have their own drill they have their own section they have their own work that they go through mm-hmm. and then the second group is uh 13 to 17 uh, those are 13 to 17 those are the secret cadets ah, and the C cadets okay. they're the older group I see uh, they okay. have their own section and mm-hmm. their own drill and own things that they do uh, what would happen when you walked in the door is first we uh, you know it's the military so there's a ton of paperwork oh okay <laughs> so alright so we'll put that to the side there's paperwork okay <laughs> so, so we, but what's the fun say, stuff let's yeah. say the, uh, the right. first thing is paperwork okay. get the paperwork out of the way because yes. you know one of the beautiful things about the program and I've got to say that I really appreciate that is that mm-hmm. There is an insurance that covers uh, children and young people, cadets, uh, that if anything happens to them while they're doing what they're yes. doing, okay. that there's a liability and there's insurance that covers Good. them for that. And that is golden, especially yes. uh, where you might run into those type of scenarios where you're sailing or you're flying Absolutely. or anything to that extent. But, uh, uh, you know, what happens? We, we go sailing, we, oh. we fly, oh my goodness. Uh, we take them out on airplanes, we, yeah. we take them to military installations, uh, mm-hmm. we have trainings, we had a sexual harassment training today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we uh, That's very important because, mm-hmm. as you know, many young people are being terrorized by those who are coming after children. Right. I mean, so we, we have those types of trainers. We uh-huh. have trainers about how to wear the uniform, how to, we have uh, leadership trainings. We, I mean, we have, uh, sometimes I just uh, tell all the cadets to sit down and I just have a knockdown, drag out re- conversation about the reality of life mm-hmm. uh, and what you may face mm-hmm. in this life, mm-hmm. uh, especially for uh, m- the majority of our cadets are, are children of color. Mm-hmm. And so for them, it's important for them to hear this because mm-hmm. they might not get to see. Absolutely. It, it, I guess. The, the 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 most inspiring part for me about this is mm-hmm. they might not hear this anywhere else. Okay, they might not get okay. a chance to, to, to okay. until until they reach a place in life where they experience these things and they say to themselves, "Well, why nobody told me? Mm-hmm. Why didn't anybody tell me that I would mm-hmm. be reaching? I would reach mm-hmm. these kind of roadblocks and have to deal with these types of scenarios?" Mm-hmm. And so we very proudly have the opportunity to share those things with them. And the young people are doing very well, and the the ones that are getting involved in the program are excelling in school and becoming better students. And even parents are even saying, "Thank God, because they're cleaning up their bedroom." Uh huh. So you're teaching, <laughs> yeah. So you're teaching them some of those right. life skills. That's right. So this really is a um, youth development program, right. and and it's for boys and girls. Boys and girls. Boys and girls. So that's really good. So, so if you come into this program or take part in this program, does that mean you? You know, you must go into the military, no. or is this ah? Okay. Absolutely not. Oh, there absolutely is no okay. military promotion whatsoever. Okay, all right. The, the only thing that 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 they will have an opportunity to think about, yes, is the fact that if they did decide to go into the military. 
completion of the program would allow them to go in two pay grades higher than mm. any other young person okay. that would go straight into the oh, military. Okay. And if they were to go to college and think about the possibility of going into becoming an officer, military officer, mm. okay. uh, this could qualify them or help them qualify for a four year full paid scholarship oh. uh, to University okay. of Michigan or Eastern Michigan University or Wayne State. Oh, fantastic. So, again, this is a development program for young people. I mean, this is just wonderful. And so I know that you. So why are you doing this? Let me just ask what I'm I'm 36. I'm 36 years old. Uh-huh. I'll be here. I'm, I'm, you know, my wife's 36. We're committed to Detroit. Yes, we live in Detroit. Uh-huh. I, I pastor in Detroit. Mm-hmm. I'm passionate about Detroit. Okay, I love black people. Mm-hmm. I'm passionate about black people, and I, if I can help change some lives mm-hmm. and get them off that bad track, so that when I'm here 20 and 30 years from now, there are people who are going to be able to say. There, I love Detroit, and I love and I love my mm-hmm. I love my my uh, people who have helped me along the way. Mm-hmm. That, that's all. That's all I get out of mm-hmm. it. That's not a. I'm not a. I'm not, I'm not a big grant person. I'm not a big foundation person. I'm not hunting for money. I'm not looking for a, a, a special program or special financial opportunity. I just want to put. I just want to create, build, and push more productive young kids. In, in Detroit that's mm-hmm. and that, that'll end up into adulthood and will be productive when they become adults and they can say Detroit did offer me something and I will never forgive it I will never forget it and I will always appreciate it for what it offered me mm-hmm. and and if 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 I can if I can do that I, I've done I've done my work and you've made an impact that's right yes indeed I Reverend Charles Williams I am just so delighted because you, you know, for lots of different reasons. I first of all, I just love uh, youth development programs mm-hmm. and programs that are in the community, um, put together by community pe- people who care and have passion. Because mm-hmm. that's how I really believe. You know, we change that's right. young people one young person at a time, and sometimes that's that's kind of hard to deal with because right. you're not doing the huge program dealing with it's thousands and thousands of young kids. You have this group that you're touching and you're making a difference. That's right. And I just love it because you represent Generation X. This, you know, the mid thirty to the fifties. And you are showing the way, I believe, for your generation and how you can do it. Just grab a young person That's and right. work with them. <laughs> Just in five, <laughs> 10, mm-hmm. 20, 25, like That's you said. Right. We, we, we're always looking for the big the big blowout you know mm-hmm. that's I've right. got 2,000 kids who right. I gave something to exactly that's not that's not what we, the impact we're trying to make mm-hmm. we're trying to I'm trying to follow you from A to B mm-hmm. to C to D to get you through college yes to get you into a job and to get you somewhere where you can say all right I, I appreciate all this was been done for me, and yes. I realized that if it wasn't there for me, um, I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had mm-hmm, today. Mm-hmm. And and if it's just two kids, mm-hmm. it's two students. If it's three students, if it's five, it doesn't matter. I think a lot of times what we try to do is we always try to go with the bazooka effect mm-hmm. when it comes to making change or when it comes to having an impact. Well, you know, look, a, a bazooka. You know, and for lack of a better way to put this, a bazooka kill a lot of people, and a and a handgun can kill a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- you know, which one is one is more precise than the other? Mm-hmm. And so, creating that change, one young person at a time, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, as we're winding down. Uh, Reverend Williams, you know, again, um, you do such big stuff in terms of pastoring your church, in terms of running the National Action Network here in Detroit and Michigan. But this piece, this hands on changing one child at a time, you know, I think is is what uh, will create legacy. Mm. Um, What closing or final words do you have something that you'd like us to remember 
and take away. You know, uh, uh, first of all, let me thank you for <laughs> this time. My pleasure. And uh, for this energy that you've, you're creating around building leaders and, and, and giving a roadmap. Uh, certainly, I appreciate them, and I know their listeners do, too. Thank you. Um, I take the words of uh, Dr. King, uh, mm-hmm. which come from old him. If I can help somebody who's traveling wrong, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, I then know my life would not be in vain. Uh, we have to be the change that we want to see. And it's, we just can't talk about it. We got to be about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, such a wonderful way to end this conversation. Ignite to impact. We got to go already. Yes, oh, we man. do. But here's the here's the great thing. I'm gonna have you back. Oh, anytime. Because I want to hear more about the work that you do in the community, and I want to hear what's happening with those young people. So maybe the next time you can come in and bring one of uh, the young leaders that you're nurturing. They would love that. Yeah, I'd love. So thank you so much, Reverend Williams, for being a part of Ignite to Impact.